Science, exercise, nutrition, health, energy, passion. One year, no beer. This is the One Year No Beer podcast, where you will find all the latest tips, tricks and hacks for a way to live better. So, Joe, thank you so much for joining us on the One Year No Beer podcast. How are you doing today? I still have no beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well. It's awesome. We are here in Iceland with, look at this incredible backdrop. Unbelievable. And somewhere over there, there are a few of your <laughs> followers. It's, it's, more, it's a cult, right? Yes, I guess you'd call them followers. And they, are, uh, they look like zombies making it over, up and over the mountain. Uh, in a near-death experience. <laughs> That's it. I mean, these people could have followed you literally to their death last night by going. So it's the... Many of them have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back to that because there is a story about you losing someone somewhere. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But um, yeah, so we're at the uh, Iceland Ultra World Championships. And yesterday I did the sprint. You did, you've done it now a couple of times? I've done the sprint uh, a couple of times. I haven't done a couple of times here. No, yeah, no, no. Okay. I've, done, I've done sprints, obviously. Yeah. I thought you no, did no. one in the morning and one in the afternoon. I didn't go out in the afternoon. Cool. I went out right before you and then that was it. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely wimped out here in Iceland. <laughs> it's tough. It was, it was um, I actually have a worse job. I've got to sit here and type emails and meet people. And I wish I didn't have to do any of that. Mm -hmm. I wish, I, like, there's nothing better than being out on the mountain. So, look, I'm not going to win any races or break any records. Maybe in emailing I could. I'm pretty fast, <laughs> I'm pretty fast at typing. But, um, yeah, well, you know all the reality of, of, of running a business, owning a business. It's yeah. just, uh, yeah, I got a different job. Yeah. Um, so let's go back into a bit of your background so um, everybody knows who the amazing Joe DeSena is. But um, So you started off in, in, in Queens? Started off in Queens. They say kings come from Queens. That's a little little inside joke. But um, it was a neighborhood of hustle. If you've ever seen the movie Goodfellas, uh, I came from ground zero of, of that. And um, I guess it made, it definitely made me and all my friends in that uh, the conversations were always about, you know, cannolis, because it was a very Italian neighborhood, cement, or going to jail. <laughs> and, um, and going to jail was a badge of honor. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was yeah. negative. So here you are, a young person, and you're looking up to the guys with Cadillacs and the money and how'd they get there. And, um, but they hustled, even though a lot of them were doing the wrong things. Um, the trucks were starting at 5 a.m., the coffee was being made, the bagels were being buttered. And so it just became part of your ethos and your fabric to be a hard worker. And so I define myself that way. I certainly wasn't the smartest uh, by any means, but I was never going to be outworked because that's how I was able to uh, rank myself versus my competition growing up. Brilliant. Yeah. So hard work, the absolute key ingredient. Well, definitely a, an important ingredient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. an important ingredient. And um, so how did you get from there to, is it, you ended up on Wall Street as a broker? Yeah, so my mother finds yoga, meditation, health food in the 1970s before it was in, in uh, vogue. Uh, there were no Whole Foods at that time. There were no yoga magazines. Uh, and this was really out there. And, um, and she's, she's preaching all these crazy concepts like uh, you shouldn't think negative thoughts because negative thoughts actually make their way into your body and out into you. It's just ridiculous stuff, which today is not so ridiculous. Right? <laughs> People now talk about, oh, you got to get this app for meditation, app for meditation. My mother was me meditating in 1972 in a room. There was no app. There was no <laughs> need, right? Like teaching yoga in the living room. I had monks in my living room. And, um, but she was weird. Right. And my sister and I didn't want any part of it. I had to explain to my friends why there were monks in the living room. And that was a hard thing to yeah. explain because, again, you want to be the cool kid with the guys with the Cadillacs and the money. You don't want to be hanging out with the monks. And um, she moves us to Ithaca. They get divorced, my mom and dad. She moves us to Ithaca, New York, which was much more accepting to these concepts. And um, and so through osmosis, I start to accept some of these things. And Cornell University happens to be lo located in Ithaca, New York. So uh, I'm leaving for high school. Can't wait to get back to the neighborhood and start making money and waking up early and getting shit done and getting away from this 
insanity. And a buddy of mine says, hey, why don't we go to Cornell? I had no intention of going to college. I didn't know really what college was. It just wasn't for me. I my SAT scores weren't good. I wasn't smart enough. And I just didn't see the benefit. And, um, and he said, look, my dad's a professor. He'll get us in. And so that would have been a neighborhood thing to say, like, you got a connection. Yeah. And so um, I said, all right, well, if your dad's, you know, I could always say no, let's let's go do interviews. So we did some interviews. I got my first suit suit on and uh, we did well, really well in the interviews. And I was excited, actually. And um, we didn't get accepted, neither of us. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so I was going to pack it in. And his dad says, listen, you can take three classes at Cornell. Most Ivy Leagues, most colleges, they'll let you take three classes as a continuing education program, the kids that got accepted were doing five classes. They were doing 15 credits. So we could do up to nine credits. And if we did well, how could they not accept us in the second semester? Because we've already proven uh, without the normal uh, method that we, we could handle the school. So it made sense. So I said, you know what, I'll, I'll do that. I'll go the first semester. I'll study like crazy. I'll figure out how to study this summer. And um, yeah, I was interested. So we both uh, buckled down. I crushed it for me. I got like two A's and a B. I did everything I could. It was like running uh, an ultra in Iceland to get, to get that to happen. And uh, we both applied. And there was no way they weren't going to accept me, and they didn't accept me. And <laughs> wow. Yeah, the, the, the head of admission said, listen, we can't let you in because then kids would learn that this is the way to get in. Uh, you should probably go to another school, and then oh. two or three years from now, you could reapply. And I thought... Fuck you. Yeah. Like, I'm coming here. I'm, I want to go to Cornell. So I did it again. And uh, they didn't accept me. So I did it again. And they didn't accept me. So now I'm falling really behind that if I, if I ever do get accepted, I'm going to have I'm gonna have to graduate a year late. And um, fourth time around, I was done. I It broke me. You know, you're, you're at mile 80 in the ultra, and I'm, I'm broken. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to move back to New York. And my mother says to me, don't move. There's a woman I teach yoga to that wants to meet you. So I meet her reluctantly. My mother doesn't have any connections. She's into yoga and branch sandwiches and what could she possibly do for me? And um, in, in the most loving possible way, her son says, right? And so I go, I have this meeting with Professor Anita Racine and she says, Joe, um, I run the textile department at Cornell. Uh, there's 92 women in the department. There's no men and we're looking to make it more interesting, get some men in the department. What do you, what do you know about textiles? Do you like textiles? And I said, I love textiles. The 92 women, I, uh, I didn't even know what a textile was. <laughs> so, so, um, so I get accepted to her department. And if I had to do it again, I would have done it. It was awesome because at that point in time, all textile companies, which were huge companies, were moving offshore, going out of business. So tremendous turmoil in the industry. So we really studied the business of clothing in, in an industry that was falling apart and just redefining itself. And uh, not to mention, I got this huge benefit that any movie I see, I know, based on hemlines, what year it's from. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Which is a really good thing to know. And so, um, <laughs> Can we test that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I graduate Cornell, and I'm about to leave, and I meet this Italian gen gentleman who had, uh, lived, lives in Ithaca, still lives there, and um, had graduated many years earlier and was a real big shot in finance. And... Um, he, we take a liking to each other. He's Italian. I'm Italian. And he sees my work ethic. And he convinces me, uh, at that point in time, I'm running a business back in Queens. I've been going back and forth in the summers. And he says, what are you doing? He says, well, you know, you got this work ethic. You need to go to Wall Street. And I didn't really know anything about Wall Street. Same way I didn't know anything about college. And he uh, proceeds to drive me crazy. Or every month on the month, when I get back to Queens and I'm running my business, he calls and says, have you sold it yet? Are you going to New York? And I was like, I, you know, I got a girlfriend. And I'm crushing it and make a couple hundred grand a year i'm like the big man on campus all my customers are wise guys and um every month for four years relentlessly and in the in the in the fourth year so you know 48 phone calls later he says all right if you're not going to listen to me you should buy this stock and i had never bought a stock before but i had accumulated a bunch of money from running this business and i buy the stock and the next day the company gets taken over and I made whatever 150 grand, and I thought, this is the greatest business ever. <laughs> I gotta, go I gotta, to, get, into I, I gotta get into this. I gotta go to Wall Street. I'm mixing cement for this. is This is unbelievable. So um, I proceed over the next six months to sell that company and make my way uh, through interviews uh, in New York uh, to get a job. Now I gotta take like 20 steps backwards because uh, the only job I can get is paying me 30 grand 
a year and here I was making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year and, and being the boss and now I'm going to be a peon on a trading desk and yep. you know bacon the, sandwiches bacon sandwiches <laughs> and you know the deal and so um I actually ho they almost had me crying one day I mean I was here I was right I ran my own company around heavy equipment and yeah. I'm like what the fuck am I doing these guys are young I could knock these guys out like, yeah. and they didn't, like so anyway um I uh, moved my way up the ranks, and I eventually start my own business in finance, and um, it goes really awful in the beginning. I can't get any customers to do business with me, and then one day, through a Cornell connection, uh, somebody gives me my first order, and then from there, it is like a snowball rolling down one of these mountains in Iceland. It just drifts bigger and bigger and bigger, and you know, in the in the late 90s, uh, 97, 98. Uh, I had a business with four of us in a room that I can't even looking back. I can't even. We were making so much money; it was unbelievable. Yeah. So, um, so we had a great, great run, and uh, always had this picture of a farm on my desk because there was no way I was going to do this the rest of my life. I didn't want to sit in front of a computer, but it was a means to an end, and it was it was uh, awesome money, as you know. Yeah. And um, and I'm getting a little chubby because I'm doing three dinners a night out with people and. I love that, uh, three dinners a night. <laughs> well, I would have them clean the table and do it again because the more customers I could see, I, qu I figured out pretty quickly, uh, the more business I would do. Amazing. So, so you just... See, in, in the oil industry, they don't, they don't, no, they don't finish dinner. You, you, you carry on until three or four o'clock oh, in the no, morning. no, 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 no. <laughs> it's it was, hard. I would do dinner, clean up, <laughs> move on to the next guy. I love that. And then uh, I, I, I got a taste uh, of the old days back uh, with my mother. Um, I started doing yoga again. I started getting into all this stuff. And I redefine myself uh, on the street with, um, rather than the dinners and, uh, and the things on the weekends, I said, you know what, I'm going to start taking people to do yoga. I'm going to start taking people to do these long distance runs, um, work out. And uh, it, it was exponential growth for me because I built a bond with these people as if I had gone to war with them or gone to jail together. Yeah. And, um, and then there was one little bonus. There's, a, there's an Italian restaurant in New York called Rayo's that you can't get a can't get a table it's like might it be easier to land on mars with elon musk's uh, unfinished <laughs> rocket than to get a table at rayo's and um one of the guys from the neighborhood that was that became a club he had a table and got me a table and that table between between that table at rayo's and then all the yoga and the things out like the business just exploded amazing and so what had, year was this this had to be like early 2000 right after the crash in 2000 yeah. and so um it's amazing because so, this is exactly what, what we are saying to so many brokers, traders, all these people oh, yeah. out there. Is that I was before it, you. Yeah, you this. were well before I, I, us. Yeah, I was. I was before <laughs> you on this. And, this, and, and you grow your business. You don't lose business. You oh, grow you grow. Business. And and no one uh, was doing it. Yeah. I. I rebranded our firm as the firm we ran stair like rather than having crazy bets that were around drinking and yeah. food, how many hot dogs can you eat, our bets became. We bet Joe can't climb fifteen thousand sets of stairs in seven hours, right? Like that. That's those are awesome. the, you know those are the bets we we started to have, and so um, so anyway, I raced around the world, and then I said, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna start putting on some races. So we put on our first race in the British Virgin Islands, uh, in the year two thousand, and uh, I was gonna have the best teams from from all around uh, the world come, and uh, it turned out to be a complete financial disaster lost a half a million bucks and I lost a guy. Uh, yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, so <laughs> so um, I I was racing like crazy at this point. That was my way to get off the desk and just calm myself. And I had done a race in Switzerland just before the race we were putting on. And apparently I contracted something called leptospirosis, which you get, you can get, it's very rare, from like a, a cow going to the bathroom in a water stream above where you drink it from. And I got it. And uh, none of the doctors in New York could figure out what it was, and they thought I had AIDS. It was like a whole uh, shit show um, <laughs> in the hospital. So um, I'm in the hospital. My team is building the course down on the British Virgin Islands. It's going to be a 350-mile race, never been done before. And um, apparently we lose a guy like while we're building the course. Um, he had cut his leg, and the team said, why don't you jump in that dinghy, go back to the main island where there's a hospital. We'll catch up with you in a couple of days. And they continue to set the course. Well, fast forward eight days, race is over, people are popping champagne, all the finishes are in, and somebody comes up to me and says, hey, we haven't seen so-and-so in like eight days. And I'm like, what do you mean you haven't seen him in eight days? And they go through the story, and I'm like, 
You telling me now? Eight days later, there's been storms and oh my god. So I get I get the Coast Guard involved. My dad, who's down there, turns to me and says, "Look, uh, there's a chance that uh, negligence is criminal down here. So we got to be really careful in how you handle this. Obviously, we want to find the guy. So I'm nervous. I'm going to go to jail over this. Got to be dead. I haven't seen him in eight days. Coast Guard finds him 150 miles away. He had drifted in this dinghy." Um, that due to the currents or whatever in the storms to an uninhabited island. And he was living there on crabs and bottled water that had also drifted oh from the race. So, um, so anyway, I'm thinking I'm going to get sued. Like this is, uh, and he lands out of the Coast Guard helicopter. And he's like, I am starving. Would somebody take me to dinner? <laughs> Which made perfect sense. So we went to dinner, but, uh, but it was awesome. Uh, and then from there, I continued to put on races, continued to lose money for a decade. Um, second big financial crisis, right, coming out of the uh, 2009, uh, I was done. This was stupid. I'd been losing money for 10 years doing this. Uh, uh, yes, it was a lot of fun. And yes, I was changing some lives. But uh, at some point, you're out of money. Yeah. You're still brokering at this point? At this point, I'm still brokering. But I had sold my brokering business. And I'm just doing it on the side from Vermont yeah. in, the, in the country. Yeah. I'm racing a ton. I, I got my few customers that are helping pay the bills. And so it's really not prudent for, now i got a family, i got four kids, I can't run this anymore. 2010, I say, you know what, I'm going to take one last stab at a new format. We're going to call it Spartan. Rather than do 350-mile races, we're going to cut it back a bit. We're going to have a 3-mile, 8-mile, 13-mile. We're going to open it up to the masses, which is what I, what I want to do anyway. I want to change a bunch of lives. And we launch. And 700 people show up to the first race. And I had never had more than like, 20 people show up to any one of my races. Wow. 700 people show up. And I'm thinking, this is unbelievable. And I'm standing in the crowd and I'm watching people transform and I'm saying, this is it. We, we nailed it. This is the format. So the next race we have is 2,100 people and 3,000 people. Now, here's the second big mistake I made. Normally, when you build a brand, which I didn't know because I'd never done one before, uh, you build from rings. So you start at a place and people know you and then you go a little further out, 100 miles and 100 miles. I went, because uh, I'm an idiot, um, and you'd think I would have learned something at Cornell. I went from my first race being in Vermont, my second race in New York, my third race Montreal, my next one Slovakia, UK. You'd never do that yeah. because nobody in Slovakia knew who we were. Nobody. Knew. So uh, the cost to try to create awareness at each one of these races was three to four hundred thousand dollars. Well, there's only so many three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar checks you can write because I'm losing money at the races because it's still building. Yeah. So this thing that I said I was going to just do and invest a maximum $50,000 in became a three to $400,000 a month credit card bill. <laughs> and I'm skiing one day, and I'm with my kids, and I'm thinking, I'm an idiot. Like, I am going to spend all the money I've been working like the last 20 years for over this thing called Spartan. This is real. I can't even explain this to my wife or the bookkeeper or anybody. This is the stupidest thing. This is sounding very familiar here. <laughs> I've, I've ever done. And um, and the bookkeeper does walk in one day and says, what What are you doing? Like, you're gonna be out of money uh, very shortly here. And so um, I called some friends on Wall, in Wall Street from that, ski, from that day of skiing. And I said, listen, you're not gonna understand. I don't have a business plan. I have no valuation in mind. Uh, I don't even know really if it's going to work, but I need a million dollars by Monday, which is tomorrow, or I'm basically out of business. I just can't keep doing it. And they sent the money. Wow. They sent the money. And uh, no valuation, no plan, no business, nothing, no paperwork. And they bought me probably three months. And I made another three months figuring by then I'd be okay, and we weren't okay. Yeah. So then, now I can't lose. My back's against the wall. I took my friend's money. Like, I got to survive, right? Yeah. So I said, oh, you know what we could do is we just won't pay bills for six months. We'll start telling all the vendors that our normal policy is we pay in 180 days. <laughs> that's the way we do it. Because we have to remain confident that it's not that we're going out of business. just that's our policy. We pay in 180 days. Yeah. And all the vendors bought into it. And so then they kicked and screamed, and like, but, they, but they went along with the, for the ride. So that bought me like another three months. So now it's happening again. I'm out of money again. And I'm thinking, I don't even know what I'm going to do at this point because I can't go, I can't pay bills any later. I can't go back to my friends and get more money. I can't put any more money into this thing. And I get a phone call from a company who wants to buy our credit card processing business. And I don't realize they're willing to pay for that. 
And because I'm not interested in changing credit card process, I don't have time to deal with it. I got bigger problems. I got a guy says, I'll pay you a million dollars to like, I said, when? He goes, I'll send you a FedEx. You'll have it tomorrow. I said, I'll, I'll switch. <laughs> 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 so um, no contract, nothing. I get a check. And I, I can't believe it. Million dollars. What do they say? Better lucky than good, right? <laughs> Better, Better lucky, than, lucky good. than good. So that buys me um, enough time to one day. The First of all, we've got seven people in an office in Vermont that are doing this. I got one Asian fellow who's doing my books who is crushing it. All Asians are fantastic at math, as we yeah. know. And this guy is doing a great job. And we've got a mattress in the in the room where he, sl he sleeps under the desk. And um, because that's how hard we were working to get this thing going. And he gets up off the mattress one morning. When I, he goes, hey, we sold 800 registrations yesterday. And I go, oh, you must have a bad file or something in your Excel spreadsheet because we're selling like 60 a day. Yeah. And he, no, he goes, we sold 800. And that was the beginning of, well, we turned the corner. Yeah. So, um, so here we are today, uh, 17 years into this. It's a, it's a 17 year overnight success. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I know, that's what everyone right. says. Everybody's like, oh it's man, so you funny. built an empire. I don't I know. How, you do, how did I do how that? How did you do that overnight? How did I do it? Yeah. I fucking had like 6,000 sled dogs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Remember the beginning of the interview, <laughs> yeah. hard work. Yeah. Right. There's no way around it. Yeah. Right. Like I wish I, yeah. So anyway. Uh, that was the beginning of it, and then it's just started to work. And um, I mean, look, you, you're here in Iceland. I, I was just uh, looking at my team who I was thinking of, of creating an image for Facebook or for social, right? Uh, just as a testament to the team we've built over all these years. And the image would be like a wolf looking right at you on one side and then like a poodle looking at you on the other side. And um, the wolf would it would say Spartan employees, and the poodle would be all other employees. <laughs> these are the toughest motherfuckers on yeah. earth. So where is Spartan today? Spartan today is forty two countries, two hundred and seventy five events, and um, it's really a lifestyle. Um, some people call it a cult. Um, some people call it a movement, but it, but it's a lifestyle. It's a way to live. It's it's much more than the race. It's uh, it's maybe less beer. Less wine, less alcohol, less junk food, uh, less hot showers, maybe a couple of cold showers in there during the week. It's, uh, it's going out for runs and doing burpees and living a life that uh, the human species was meant to live. Yeah. Active, healthy, active, active, fit, healthy. connected. Yeah. yeah. Um, and living, living in the connected. And this is a group, you know, Gabo Mati talks about it. Um, I think you talk about it partly in your book as well about um, how many. Uh, Addiction has got a sort of negative connotation to it. So, you know, for most of our audience, they would never consider themselves addicted. Although there is we lots provide of a healthy addiction. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's a healthy addiction, and also connecting people in a healthy way is the opposite of addiction. Yep. Um, but you know, I was I was talking yesterday to you about some of the similarities between Spartan and One Year No Beer, and I think there's a huge aspect of when you decide to push yourself and challenge yourself. Yep. So tell me a bit more about that, how you feel well, so I, to somebody when they start channeling. Yeah, so I know I know just from doing this now, God, 20-something uh, years between competing myself and putting on races that um, the human speed, there's very few of us that don't need a date on the calendar. Um, I happen to be rare in that I could just wake up and work out and I don't need um, something to do. But I, but I do get more motivated when it's like my buddy says, hey, we're going to run 50 miles in two weeks, you win. And I'm very careful about how I answer that because once I say yes, I'm committed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, I say yes, I'm committed. Now my game is up. Start. I got two weeks to get ready for 50 miles. I'm running 10 miles a day. I'm doing 300 burpees every day, 150 pull-ups. Whereas if I wasn't signed up in two weeks or two months or whatever it is, I'm still going to work out because that's just the way I am. But I'm not going to play at that level. So, uh, by the way, this is not unique. Uh, the reason uh, in college that, that term papers and things get done on Friday is because they're due on Friday, right? <laughs> if the professor said, yeah, do them when you yeah, can, yeah. right? No. doesn't happen. Yeah. So we all we need, need those, those, those dates, uh, hard stakes in the sand that say, here's your date, get it done. So we're really, um, what, I guess another way to, to describe Spartan would be like we're an accountability machine. Yeah. We hold you accountable. And we do it on the course too, right? Because uh, if I said to people, hey, do these obstacles, what I saw in the beginning was, uh, yeah, they might do the obstacle. They might walk around the obstacle. They might quit in the middle. 
So I said, fuck that. 30 burpees. If you Now, a lot of people are pissed off about it. My employees come to me and say, hey, listen, you know, when we go to a new market like Japan, they don't really want to do the burpees. We'd get more cut. I don't care. They're doing the burpees. Yeah. If they don't, they go do a different race. And one race, I stood outside in the parking lot in Scotland. It's pouring rain. It was a miserable day. Raining in Scotland. Raining in Scotland, which is very rare. <laughs> and I'm standing in the parking lot, and um, I'm seeing all these competitors come in with medals, and they're happy. And I looked them in the eyes, because that's just the way I am. And I said, hey, did you do, your, you do all your burpees? Because some people might do 28, 27, right? And uh, you could see people start looking down. <laughs> and so I said, well, give me your medal back. You didn't finish. Oh, you could do them here. And look. So I had hundreds of people doing burpees in the parking lot to make <laughs> to make up. So I said, I have to get a lie detector test. That's what we need. Yeah. We need to funnel everybody out, and they have to get take a Did lie detector. Did you do your burpees? Did you do all your burpees or not? <laughs> so, but that just goes to show you that that um, people will cut corners. Yeah. Um, they will. Even right. And so there's so much science behind that as yeah. well. People in the line. They, yeah. The SAS actually sent, tries to trick people up with that, so they send them off. And, and part of there and, and and don't have no one checking them although they think right and then when they come back they're like you didn't you didn't do your burpees we know yeah. you didn't but um i want to talk about the inclusivity of it because yeah. i think sometimes the biggest fear factor for doing a challenge like one year no beer right yeah. why would you want to give up alcohol for a year that's just ridiculous you know yeah. why would you want to go and run around on those hills in the freezing cold overnight yeah. when i the reality is, for most people, the Spartan, although it appears like it could be this huge, scary obstacle race, yep. it's incredibly inclusive. Yep. I've seen very overweight, semi unfit. Oh, I mean, out I, I here, this arguably this is the toughest 100 miles in the world, hands down, like no question about it. I have a guy that has run, run across the Sahara Desert. He's here. Ran across the entire Sahara, never been done before. He ran a, maybe a couple of camels years ago. Who knows? Uh, Lawrence of Olivier, whatever his name was. <laughs> yeah, Lawrence of Arabia, right? He's got the, he's got the uh, scarf on, camel. This guy ran across Sahara. He was laying in a pool of drool a few hours ago, and he said, he said, I I'll go do the Sahara there and back. I don't want to I don't, I don't come back here. No camel. <laughs> so... He's a hardest the heat. hundred miles on earth we yeah. just experienced, and yet you're right. You see moms out there. You see yeah. some overweight people, and so, um, which is what we want. We listen. Human beings are pretty rugged individuals. It's just that we've learned helplessness. Yes, that's it. It's learned helplessness, isn't it? And we yeah. sit on a couch and and we yeah. put up with it. And the thing is, do you see my couches here? <laughs> you see what I did? You got the blow up couches. Uh, yeah. Do you know why we did them? Right. They automatically deflate. <laughs> <laughs> so. You, you, so can, you can enjoy the yeah, people yeah, exactly. You, you can enjoy the couch for a little while. After a while, it's not a couch anymore. You're laying on the stone. <laughs> Get off the couch. Yeah. So did you time it? How long they yeah, got? Yeah, exactly. Like 15 20, minutes. Twenty minutes. That's it. Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes of couch <laughs> time. Couch <to> deflates. <laughs> yeah. So um, I really have to say, our genuine who's thinking about it, because the yeah. biggest thing about the Spartan is like a, a no alcohol challenge yeah. is the sense of achievement and yeah. getting over these obstacles. And we sort of, you talk about that in the book, a bit, a bit of a parody of life, really. Yeah. They were all sent these obstacles. Um, and well, the, life is a series of obstacles, and it's not the obstacles that define you. It's how you react to the obstacle that defines you, right? Yeah. So, welcome them. Yes. My God, that makes that makes life so interesting, right? You, you, you're having, oh my God, I couldn't handle the obstacle of no beer for a year or wine, whatever. Bullshit. Yeah. The only reason we drank beer and wine 100, 200, 500 years ago was because we couldn't figure out why everybody was getting sick with the water. Once we got clean water, we don't need that shit anymore. Yeah, exactly. And we've right? got clean water. We've got clean places. water. Yeah. Most places. Um, and drinking. So you haven't had a drink for 17 years? I will have a sip. I mean, literally a sip of wine here and there. Not because I, li I don't like the taste. Mm. Like, I am very, very fortunate in that I don't like the taste of beer. I don't like the taste of alcohol, period. End of story. So I would only drink it for two reasons. One, because my wife drinks wine. And so I... Uh, it's weird, right? All the time. So I'll we're have working on that, aren't we? We're working on that. She just committed, actually, thanks to you. Um, she's given it up for my birthday, uh, January 2nd. Awesome. So, so, that's, so, so I'll never have a sip again. And then uh, the only other reason I would have drank years ago is to get drunk because that's what everybody was doing. Yeah. But otherwise, I'm very fortunate. I don't like the taste of alcohol and I don't like the taste of coffee. Yeah. So um, I'm good. I like water. And you get the high from uh, getting out there and climbing Icelandic Much hills. higher. Then, then climb. Yeah, you come to Iceland and climb a mountain. We should, by the way, you've got a, an insane amount of uh, people that have joined your your cult, and um, <laughs> we, we should um, 
offer them if they um, will do an honor system yeah. if they've made it so long a year, I yeah. guess. Although that's too long. Why don't we do something that's the 28 day and the 90 day. The 90 day is the, is the main challenge. So let's do 90 days. Yeah. And uh, anybody that, that raises their hand and says they've done, they've done 90 days, I'll give them a free entry to a Spartan race in the UK. Mo mo most of your customers in the UK. Most in the UK, but we've got plenty yeah. in the US Yeah, so well. do that. Um, and then, and then if they don't finish, what we'll do, if they don't finish the Spartan race, yeah. uh, then they have to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> if right. they don't finish the Spartan yeah. race. Yeah, they have to pay me. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, it's free. Yeah. No, they'll All definitely. Right. And, and that's the thing. I think this is such a great, um, because a lot of it is mental, yeah. you know, getting into a Spartan race, booking one in 90 days, that's part yeah. of our program. Yeah. So exactly like you said, like yeah. the Friday thing, the deadline, yeah. and because you know that the Spartan is coming, yeah. you're gonna train, you're gonna, you're gonna avoid It'll the booze. It'll be easy to avoid the booze, exactly. it'll be super easy. So so let's put that out there and we will, um, who knows, maybe we could transform 25,000 alcoholics. Yeah, exactly. That'd be great. That'd be amazing. Yeah. And anyone else who drinks, because um, that's the key thing, it's, it's literally anyone. It's, Anyone yeah. who's drinking a little bit, let's remove the alcohol from them. Yeah. We have to be careful with the term alcoholic because it's so AA. Yeah, and, okay. And, and, that's, and the interesting thing we were thinking about the other day, like Spartan. I, I you, use that term um, in a friendly way. I didn't yeah, mean it in a negative way. Yeah. Um, but yeah. the, um, the, the, like the Spartan, yeah. you're going around the race. Instead of somebody coming through an obstacle and failing the obstacle and being sent back to the start, yeah. which is how many of these abstinence programs have worked and sure. do work. Yeah. If you slip up on a day, you back to the beginning. Yeah. You never, you never do that. If you slip up, it's thirty burpees. Yeah. And I think we need to start introducing. That, we should right? introduce so thirty burpees. If you slip yeah. up, yeah. there's thirty burpees, yeah. and you have to film it and put yeah. it into the group. Yeah, <laughs> I like that a lot. And then, and then sometimes what we'll do is if somebody slips up too much, we just bury them on the course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, just, it's so much easier because then nobody really knows what happened to them, and I'm off the hook. And so the only other thing we have to do yeah. is make sure that they've got a beer token for non-alcoholic beer at the end. I like that. And we can definitely introduce you. I mean, yeah. Heineken or bit Bud I just, I, or What I just visualized was just because I'm a sadist, um, two fire hoses. <laughs> 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 like, and you just knock them off their feet. <laughs> if, if you can't tell me about drinking too much. Yeah, right. If you really can't, can't stop drinking, here's some water yeah, for exactly. you. Yeah. I love it. Um, it's been amazing to have you on, You're Joe. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. Such an inspiring guy, and hope to have you on again soon. Thank the you. good news about this interview is we only got minimal frostbite. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Thanks very much, Joe. Right. Thanks for listening to the One Year No Beer podcast. For a full list of episodes and to join in the challenge yourself, head on over to oneyearnobeer.com. One